And you're gonna start, okay. Hi everyone, welcome uh, this morning. I'm just gonna give it a minute. It looks like we have participants sort of rolling in here. I'm checking the bottom of my screen. So I'm gonna give it another minute or so just so that we can allow attendees to come on and sign on and then we will get started. Looks like every attendees are just rolling in. So quick housekeeping before we get started as those are signing on. If you have any questions today throughout the webinar, please feel free to chat. That chat will go to myself and all of the panelists. Um, so please know that even though if you're not seeing it in the chat box, we will be able to see all of your questions. Um, and as we go through, we'll be doing the best to monitor chat and sort of group questions together and do our best to get your questions answered. All right. It's fun seeing the numbers tick up on this. Um, so good morning, I am Jenny Cammy. I am the director of The Hive at Leech Tide Commons. The Hive is uh, Leech Tide Commons Center for Connection, Creativity, and Collaboration. And today we're presenting this uh, series, Leadership Counts, it's our first one, in partnership with Impact Cubed, another initiative of the Leech Tide Foundation. And our goal, you know, I've said this a few times now, but I think it bears repeating, is that although we are separated and in isolation, our mission at The Hive has not changed. We are 100% about collaboration. Um, we have three fantastic organizations that have collaborated with us today, San Diego Food System Alliance, ACLU, and Vista Community Clinic. Um, we are connected in the best way that we know how, which is through the Zoom platform right now, and using our best to bring you engaging content um, in a creative format. So we are still here for you, even in this um, wild world that we're living in. And again, for those of you who are just logging on, if you have questions, please feel free to chat throughout and we will be monitoring those. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to Charlene Seidel, Executive Vice President of the Leech Tag Foundation, who will be moderating today's session. Thanks, Jenny. Hi, everybody, welcome. Um, it's really, good to sort of look at my screen and I guess you can see the same screen I can and just see like three women that I admire a lot very very much and I've known um, their organizations and them just in different contexts and um, oh Sharon you're also on the screen <laughs> hi Sharon also I admire Sharon perfect um, and uh, anyway, so we have a really, really good group of, of guests, and um, I, don't, I don't know about you, but for me, I'm a bit of a control freak, right? True confessions to our close friends here, and a pandemic and the uncertainty of a pandemic doesn't... One of the things that have been most um, comforting or, or helped me is really staying connected to people who really know, who are really on the ground with vulnerable people, with people who are really affected in a day by day, with medical professionals, with, with those who are just intensely experiencing this pandemic beyond, you know, having to Netflix and chill. <laughs> um, and it's, we're all experiencing it on different levels, but I'm really excited to bring you three or to have a conversation today with three women that I think are some of those people that are very connected to the ground, that do understand some of the key needs, particularly focusing in, in a couple areas that we feel is really, really important to us in San Diego. We're a border city, obviously. We're, we're right on the border with Mexico. It's an active border. And so that is a dimension that we have here in San Diego that we want to explore today in the context of COVID. Um, and of course, we are um, one of the largest um, counties for for farm for organic farms for farms. Where where we have a major restaurant industry, a food service industry, um, you know, farming, as I said, fisheries, and um, that also has been that sector has been tremendously impacted by this pandemic. And so, it's really we wanted to really sort of catch up on what's going on there um, on that ground. Um, I've been thinking also a lot about how we define essential and non-essential in our society. It's just really, really struck me in ways that I don't think it's ever struck me before. I think, I hope that it will, it will influence my leadership as we move forward and out of this because certainly 
some of the things that I, I'll be, you know, open that I maybe valued as essential a little bit more are not, as it turns out, the essential services. The essential services are, of course, those in healthcare, but they're the people that are picking up our trash, cleaning our streets and homes, those who are on the front lines of our grocery stores, those who are harvesting our food, and on and on. Those are, we've seen, those are the essential people in our in our society and our society certainly has not valued them as such. So, so um, the, food, the food industry and the farming industry are certainly among those that have been deemed essential, essential services. For me, it's really been a reckoning. Um, the food industry is also one of the hardest hit, if not, if not the hardest hit in terms of job loss, equity issues, potential prevalence of the illness of COVID-19. Many of these workers are already the most vulnerable. As we know, they're coming from the hardest hit, um, historically underfunded, underrepresented communities already in low wages, poor work conditions, and on and on and on. So there's a rippling effect. Um, fresh produce is more you know, needed than ever for, for health reasons, for balance. Yet again, we're encountering systemic issues that, that existed, but have just been incredibly accelerated and exacerbated in the midst of, of COVID. Um, some of our essential food and agriculture workers make long trips across the border. We want to hear a little bit more about what's going on there, what's really going on there. And finally, um, COVID really represents not only some new trends and needs, certainly, but a profound intensification and an acceleration of existing needs and gaps and just a, a widening of existing gaps. And so that's another theme that we'll explore in the, in, the, um, in the conversation today about how there could be potential to look at some opportunities rather than just let it go, let it slide into the really with dangerous ramifications. So as I said, really pleased to have three expert guests who are very rooted in their on the ground expertise, deeply rooted in the communities. The way we're gonna kind of set this conversation up is first um, Sona Desai, who is the deputy director of the San Diego Food System Alliance. And the bios were on everybody's um, invitation and some of the materials that went out. I don't think I'm gonna read them again, but um, please consult them because they all three women have very impressive bios. Uh, Sona will give a short um, overview of the data that was highlighted in the San Diego Food System Alliances, which we're really honored to partner with, a really important resource in our community. They, they released a research report very quickly um, entitled COVID-19 and our food system, immediate impacts and priority recommendations for policymakers and funders. That was, I believe, emailed to you a link and certainly we'll include that with the follow-up materials. It's an excellent report and I would encourage you all to, to look at it carefully. Sona is gonna speak, we're gonna bookend Sona. So she's gonna speak at the beginning about some of the data that was sourced in that report. Then Norma, Hermini and I will discuss, have a conversation about kind of playing that data out also on the ground through some really direct needs and experiences. And then Sona will have questions and then Sona will come back at the end to talk a little bit more about those policy recommendations and what do we do with all this need? How do we move forward productively, positively to actually turn incredible need into opportunity? So Sona, I think with that, I'll turn it over to you to give, um, to give a few minute report on the data. Great, great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Charlene. Hello. Hello, everyone. I'm going to, I do have some slides, so I'm going to transition here to show my screen and share that with you all. All right. Hopefully, hopefully you all can see see the slides. And so again, thank you so much, Charlene, for, for hosting and for framing this important conversation and of course for inviting me to, to join. Um, as Charlene mentioned, I'm Sona Desai and I'm with the San Diego Food System Alliance. At a high level, we're um, a nonprofit organization with a mission to cultivate a healthy, sustainable, and just food system here in San Diego County. We are a network of over 150 organizations and we work to promote collaboration, influence policy, and catalyze transformation in the food system. So like many of you, like others, we've been shifting our priorities 
to better support our food system in this time of crisis. And we've been connecting with our network, talking with those most impacted, farmers, food workers, hunger relief organizations, food businesses, to really try to understand and identify the immediate needs and impacts across the food system and to be able to assess some of those short and long-term impacts. We do have a COVID resource page that you're welcome to visit um, at any point that's on our website and it houses a lot of resources. And then as, as Charlene mentioned, we have developed um, an issue brief, which is really what will be a little bit of the focus of what I'm hoping to share um, over the next few slides. And um, the way that we have organized, we know that this, we know that COVID is impacting everyone broadly, but we really wanted to elevate the four main areas of our food system where we're seeing, where we were hearing and seeing the greatest need. And those are food and farm workers, food businesses, farms and fisheries, and then of course the impact on food security. So looking at, you know, looking at the data and just sort of zooming out, you know, it's clear that the impact of COVID-19 is dramatically affecting food workers, food and farm workers. These are the people that are on our front lines every day working to produce, prepare, deliver, and serve our food. We have over 212,000 food and farm workers here in San Diego County. As, as many of us probably know, the average um, annual wages for these workers are 28,000 annually. This is the lowest of any sector in San Diego County. And most of the food and farm workers are people of color, undocumented and or temporary workers. It is clear that these are our essential, as Charlene mentioned, our most essential workers, yet unfortunately our most undervalued and underpaid workers. So when we think about what's happening on the ground for food and farm, food and farm workers. What we've been seeing is, you know, since March, uh, uh, national, state, and local unemployment rates have skyrocketed. It's jobs at food service and drink drinking establishments, those seem to account for the largest number of losses. And then on the ground, you know, we're seeing the mass layoffs um, in combination with weak labor rights, limited safety nets, and low wages that are really pushing food and farm workers into, into precarious situations. And again, the majority of these food and farm workers are people of color, undocumented, and most have been left out of government stimulus packages. In terms of food businesses, we have a thriving uh, food business sector, as Charlene mentioned, over 13,000 retail food businesses. And these are businesses that are generally, again, employing, um, employing many, many workers, but a large proportion of people of color, communities of color, and immigrant populations. We have 190,000 people that are food workers employed by food businesses in San Diego County, and they're generating over 17 billion in food sales annually. You know, what's happening there for food businesses is we're seeing that they're suffering significant losses and they're having to furlough and lay off, lay off food workers and employees. At this stage, um, about 60%, according to the California Restaurant Association, about 60% of San Diego County's restaurants have closed in the past month. And it's really unclear how many will survive. I think the recent estimates from California Restaurant Association are that maybe 30% may not survive survive the pandemic. So again, profound impacts on our food economy and employ and those that are working within the food sector. And then of course, the backbone of our food system, farms and fisheries. And we have a thriving sector, over 5,000 farms, over 22,000 people that are employed, and over 1.7 billion that's generated annually by San Diego County Farms. Around 500 million of this is contributed, um, is, is food, food production. And then we also have a um, seafood, um, seafood industry as well that has uh, over 300 people working, 2.8 million pounds, and 11 million generated in sales. So what's going on for farms and fisheries? You know, we're seeing um, a, a lot of markets that have um, shifted, obviously, with restaurants closed. So you're seeing food producers really trying to figure out um, how to adapt their business and how to keep their employees. How do they keep their farm workers? How do they keep their food workers in this time of uncertainty and low sales? And so, you know, there's some farms that are, are 
thriving right now in that they are actually able to, they're seeing an uptick in demand. And those are the farms that are generally selling through direct channels. So getting food through folks through farm stands and CSAs. And then on the flip side, we have a lot of farms that were wholesaling that are really dealing with some surplus and trying to figure out how to move those products and how to retain their farm workers and employees. All across the board, farms and fisheries are really struggling to try to figure out how they stay ahead and abreast of emerging new and emerging safety protocols and how do they make sure that they're getting this critical information and protecting their workers and employees and this is an this is a an ongoing challenge that we've been hearing and seeing from farms across the board across the board and and then of course here as well with stimulus funds you know the stimulus funds have have really um, not been supporting our small and mid-sized producers and then of course what does this all mean you know we see all of these layoffs we see all of these biz all of the um, the unemployment numbers that are skyrocketing and so food insecurity we already had here in San Diego County one in seven or one in five children that are food insecure over 50 over 55 percent of the food insecure are Hispanic and Latinx so we can see the disproportionate nature of food insecurity and how that how and who that's affecting and so here we're also seeing an increased demand um, CalFresh programs doubling uh, schools are a primary source of, of food during this time, especially through their free and reduced meal programs. And there's been a 75% drop in the number of meals through these programs. And we're seeing all kinds of organizations stepping up to try to figure out how we solve this challenge of, of food insecurity right now, from traditional folks like the food banks and leaning organizations, all the way to even the private sector farms, restaurants, or farmers markets are all trying to figure out how to how to feed people. And you know, the, the rates here were, are going to keep rising in parallel with unemployment rates. And, and today, I think as of right now, you know, nationally, we're at about 15% in terms of unemployment rates. Um, here in San Diego County, in, as of March, we were at 3. I think 2%. And we are closing out, we are closing out at um, uh, in, at the end of March, we closed out at around 4.2%, and April is, you know, likely going to be around closer to 10%. So we're going to have a massive leap in unemployment rates just over the past month. And as of right now, I think California is projecting upwards of 20 to 25% by year end. So it's clear that um, there's 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 definitely um, a, a lot of challenges that we're experiencing now, but a lot more that's yet to come. So before I pass it on, I also wanted to just quickly highlight a few of the uh, geographic distribution and racial disparities that are associated with coronavirus that we're seeing. So, you know, it's as of right now, San Diego is third across California in terms of the number of cases just trailing behind Los Angeles and Riverside. And we see the disproportionate impact, you know, always in terms of vulnerable communities and starting with, you know, communities, uh, red line communities, southeastern San Diego, that really are the same areas where you see the highest rates of SNAP, SNAP usage, you see the highest rates of low income. The, you know, there's a pattern and a trend that we've seen around which communities are disproportionately impacted. And those tend to be the communities of people of color, immigrants, um, if people of color and immigrant populations. So similarly, when you look at the Healthy Places Index, you see the same spots, you know, those bright red spots in southeastern San Diego, parts of North County, and then East County, where you're seeing, you know, lack food deserts and or lack of healthy or accessible food. And then when you look at coronavirus, we see the 13 top zip codes in San Diego County that have cases of over 100 or more are all low income areas with largely Hispanic and Latinx populations. So it, it's, it's clear, you know, and then you take a look at the final slide here on the summary of cases by race or ethnicity. And, you know, we have nearly 60% of those cases are Hispanic or Latino, while they only comprise 34% of the population. So it, it's, you know, it's hard to, to deny or it's hard to ignore the disproportionate impacts that we're seeing. And the data is really showing and reflecting this to be true during this time. So thank you so much. That's, um, I'll just pass that back to you, Shirley. Thank you, Sona. I don't know if, thank you. That was really um, excellent data, just really urgently compiled and gives us a really good foundation for the conversation that we're gonna have. And then 
we won't leave, leave you, like I said, with all the need, we'll circle back on um, opportunities and policy recommendations towards the end. Just a quick definition, I think probably most people know, but SNAP stands for Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, which is the government food assistance program, whether it be food stamps or other sources of support for food. Um, and as Sona said, certainly disproportionate use among among certain communities and and sectors. So I'd like to switch gears a little bit to um, Norma to a conversation with Norma Chavez and um, Herminia Ledesma. I hope I pronounced your last name right, Herminia. Um, so Norma serves as the executive director of the ACLU of San Diego and Imperial Counties. I could go on and on about all of Norma's accomplishments and leadership. It's just a joy to work with Norma. But I'll say that she's really been a visionary leader in redefining what equity can and should be looking like in many, many ways in our community and is just an incredible leader. Um, and Herminia works as the, directs the Farm Workers Care Coalition among her other duties at Vista Community Clinic, which is serving um, a lot of, and Herminia will talk more about this, but migrant health needs, farm worker health needs, and has built deep trust in that community that is just really incredible and needed if we're going to be making any kind of breakthrough. So as I said, um, really two wonderful guests. So, so Norma, I wanted to start with you and maybe just with some personal reflections um, a little bit before we get into the hard, the hard issues. Just what drives your remarkable leadership what what has been what gives kind of life to your work to really support the most vulnerable thank you first thank you Charlene and Leech Tag for inviting me to join you for this really important conversation um, and hello everyone I can't see you but I hope that you are healthy and and um, and staying safe during these times. You know, a little bit about my personal journey and what drives me. You know, I'm an immigrant. I, I was born in uh, a little village in Michoacan, uh, for those of you that know that part of Mexico. And I came to this country when I was, you know, five and a half years old. And I, when I tell this story, I, I kind of tell folks, you know, as a five and a half year old, I had no idea what borders were, what nation states were, what legal, illegal, what policy conversations were. But what I do know, and I still remember and can tap into that feeling, um, is, is, you know, my mother had come first to California, left us with my grandmother, and I still to this day could remember and can tap into that memory um, that's deep in my heart and my bones when I was told that I was finally going to be brought you know, to El Norte or to the other side to be reunited with my mother and half of my siblings. And so I know what that feeling is. I, I experienced that. And I think that journey of being, you know, I was raised by a single mom who raised seven children. She was an immigrant mother who was undocumented, who worked really hard in all sorts of industry, uh, whether it was packing avocados or cleaning hotel rooms to give her children uh, opportunity and access. And so I really think that that story is what has driven all of my work. And, you know, I'm honored to lead the ACLU, but I've really been organizing in my own community since I was a teenager, grew up in South Bay, San Diego. And I think that that passion for justice, that passion for change really comes deeply from that, my own lived experience, but also the experience of, of my mother and my grandmother. Wow a strong line of women um that's that's thank you for that that's really powerful can you share a little bit more in depth you're so connected to what's going on always at the border but especially now at the border crossing particularly around the situation of some of the essential workers that might be crossing for our you know who are serving our food and farm you know farms but also beyond that how do you see it on a lived basis yeah, I mean, it's, it's, you know, we're a binational thriving border region uh, that has been in existence, obviously, for a long time. And, I, and something that, a quote that comes to mind that, you know, kind of guides me too as we think about this moment is Martin Luther King's quote, right? We're caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tight in a single garment of destiny. Whatever mm. affects one directly affects all of us indirectly. Now, there's close to 2 million folks that live 
right on the other side of the border. And I myself, my older brother lives in Tijuana. Like, you know, for families that, that um, for those of us that are able to cross those borders, there's a real connection um, to living binationally, or, you know, some folks refer to it as being fronteriza, right? Uh, being of the frontier or of the borderlands where, you know, your, your grandmother's there, your, and there's this just, you know, um, connection. Um, we do know that the cost of housing and ability to provide for your, your families has been really difficult. We saw the data that Sona shared around you know, some of the jobs that we're talking about, these essential workers are some of the lowest paid jobs. And so if you can't afford to pay $1,700 for an apartment, you go and you live in Tijuana and you pay $500 or whatever. So we actually have lots of folks that are U.S. citizens or folks that are legal permanent residents that for years have lived in Tijuana. Many of them are these essential workers, whether it's in the restaurant industry or working in different, obviously those that are able to, with documentation, whether it's US citizenship or some type of immigration status, that they really kind of flow back and forth because the cost of housing is so much more affordable. So that's been in existence for a really long time. And I think what we're seeing now, I think it was March 20th when the federal government um, basically closed the border um, to only allow for essential, essential travel. Um, so there's obviously been impacts there. There's been many of the folks that we, you know, that Sona described as being laid off live in Tijuana. So they're there waiting to see what's going to happen. So it's definitely impacted that, that binational flow at the port of entry. And it's also affected our immigration system. Many of us know, right? We've seen the, the, the influx of Central American or Cameroonian or refugees, asylum seekers that are fleeing persecution or, you know, or, or other political unrest um, at our borders. And that completely has pretty much halted. I think the federal government refers to it as limited field processing and returning people to Mexico. Um, just this morning in preparation for this call, I called a good friend of mine, Esmeralda, who runs a coalition of all the shelters on the Mexican side, just to touch Face with her and see how she was doing and she's like the shelters themselves the migrant shelters aren't uh, they aren't opening their doors to folks that might be coming and they have seen a major decrease of migrants that typically arrive at our border because even the southern Mexican border is closed so it's having an impact across the board from those folks that you know are used to kind of crossing daily to the folks that are in search of that um, asylum and and or just protection so we're we're seeing it all over just to ask you a little bit of a sh like a more pointed question a specific question the the essential nature that was given for border crossings does that include like if you have somebody that's been deemed an essential worker here you know in agriculture say mm -hmm. are they allowed to cross the border assuming they have documentation or or not yeah, they're, they're allowed to cross the border if they're, you know, they, they have to kind of show, you know, if they're a healthcare worker. Some of them might be medical assistants, et cetera. They've got to be able to kind of, uh, and again, these are all folks that are obviously crossing because they're U.S. citizen or a legal permanent resident or have some kind of status where they could cross the border. So that's been kind of how it's done in the last couple of weeks. And I know because my brother, my brother, I'll just say, for example, he owns a tow company. So a tow company is not considered essential. And so for a while, he couldn't even cross, right? Um, and so more recently, they've been a little bit more flexible and you hear more of longer wait lines again. And, you know, there's more people that are coming. And so, yeah, they're supposed to be regulating that. Um, and they're going to continue to, I think, figure it out as this pandemic evolves. Thank you. Um, Herminia, I wanted to ask you to just describe the Farm Workers Care Coalition a little bit more about it, how it got started, and what you do, and also how you're pivoting in this time of corona that has affected the sector so, so broadly. Yeah. Thank you for having me. I'm uh, delighted to be here with uh, folks I really admire, so thank you again. Uh, I wanted to share a little bit about Farm Worker Care Coalition and I'll first start by 
reintroducing myself. Uh, my name is Herminia Ledesma and I work for Vista Community Clinic, which serves as the backbone agency for Farm Worker Care Coalition. And I also happen to have a, a formal a chair role in Farm Worker Care Coalition and have had for a little while. So uh, this year is my first year uh, serving as vice chair as I served as chair um, for many years. And, and so um, I'm, you know, we're also adapting and, uh, but, you know, really trying to continue and doing our work. So Farm Worker Care Coalition is a group of agencies uh, that are committed to serving and bringing resources to North County and really with the focus of serving our farm worker and migrant communities. Uh, farm Worker Care Coalition has been working for over uh, two decades and um, folks who might know history before, there's actually history before that, but two decades ago is when it was actually formalized. And the one goal was to ensure the connectedness and access to community resources. And so the initial goal and founding of Farm Worker Care Coalition was really to get agencies talking to each other. And I think that still you know, remains true today. How can we work together to improve the working and living conditions of farm workers and now migrant communities in North County? Since then, and these are agencies, sorry, interrupt, that are providing a wide variety of social services to yeah, farm so workers? we okay. are a multi-sector coalition. So we have folks from, so my agency is a healthcare center, for example, but we also have uh, our partners from the insurance sector, from you know the county, different departments of the county, Office of Emergency Services, uh, you name it. We are working uh, eagerly to make sure that that's ramped up and uh, Rapid Response Network and ACLU have formed part of uh, our uh, coalition as well. Um, so uh, one of the first efforts that Farm Worker Care Coalition uh, as a whole uh, deployed in the community was actually emergency preparedness and disaster response. So really responsive, responding to the fires, which is a model that we're still uh, you know, doing and, and employing in the community, and then really shifting gears. And then of course, we're always focusing on referrals to community resources and, uh, and then supporting research efforts. So I think you know, Sona painted a really beautiful picture using uh, the data. And of course, one of the things that we keep our, our our focus on is making sure that the data is also coming from farm worker communities because we know that folks are really, uh, you know, there needs to be that level of trust to gain that uh, complete data that we want to look at. And uh, coupled with uh, all of those efforts that I just shared, the other goals that that we are doing is just making sure that we're responding to community needs and then uh, really getting resources out there, right? So as many of your agencies have, Farm Worker Care Coalition has really shifted the way we're working now to really respond to the COVID pandemic. And each agency within our coalition is doing incredibly creative work to still serve the community and the projects and other things that we still were offering. And as we were gaining our footing, a wonderful group of community members knew of the need and knew of the work that Farm Worker Care Coalition was doing. And since uh, really created a movement, I want to say, because we're still seeing the benefits of it today. And it resulted from actual tangible donations uh, of, of both food and PP and uh, funding. And then uh, what the funding specifically is going to be dedicated towards cash assistance. So one of the things that has really shifted for us during this time is that Farm Worker Care Coalition really focused on that partnership model and really didn't had very through our coalition members had the direct contact but as a coalition didn't have the outward facing components of it but with the funding that we now have acquired the funding that folks are going to get in north county related to cash assistance will be coming from farm worker care coalition and so i think you know um i want to say to those uh you know community members that express my gratitude, of course, and then say that through their efforts, we're going to be able to reach about 200 folks with the funding that we have so far. And then, of course, we're working on increasing that. 200 farm workers who are nourishing us, really, right? Like, they're the yeah. ones that are, okay. 
Yeah, wow. well, and um, so some of the funding that we received is actually targeted towards our undocumented community members. So not necessarily farm workers, but folks like domestic workers, food service workers. So really uh, trying to fill in the gaps of, of folks. And then of course we have do have dedicated funding to our farm worker communities. And uh, one of the things that, that we're making sure to do is to really just keep that conversation with each other of all of the agencies doing this work. I think all of us know that, uh, you know, whether we liked it or not, there was silos in, in the work. Uh, and so really uh, one of the things that we're working towards is getting out of our silo and making sure that we're keeping those conversations going. And I think that, you know, uh, making sure that we are identifying what each of us is doing so that one, we don't duplicate, but so that hopefully we can leverage and make just that much more of a bigger impact in the community that we're serving. So it's a little bit about farm worker care and uh, uh, Thank about our programs. Thank you. Norma, um, you were involved um, a few weekends ago in a major, in leading a really incredible demonstration of support for farm workers that I think Herminia, you know, described, but maybe talk about how, why you were involved and what that experience was to you and just say a little bit more about that experience, just to give people some sense of those people that are working yes. to grow our food. Yeah, I'll say, you know, I mean, you all know, I run the ACLU, so it's not like I'm not busy, but it was a Saturday night and we were actually celebrating a good friend of mine's birthday through Zoom. Many of us are doing these Zoom things. And another friend of ours who actually went to San Diego State with me and is a middle school principal in Watsonville, that same day had just helped to organize a caravan of appreciation for farm workers. Um, because we, you know, in our conversation, I mean, I, I've got to say, you know, my, I have family members that are in the medical field. And of course, our frontline workers are, are, are saving us. Um, but it was a, a total, um, you know, we were, because, we were having a conversation about the fact that like, farm workers are feeding us. Like if it wasn't for their labor and their work, we wouldn't have those fruits and vegetables, like you said earlier, Charlene, that we need to sustain ourselves and, and be healthy. And, you know, um, everybody thinks about farm workers and they sometimes think of the Central Valley or, you know, Salinas, but we have our own farm working community here. And so it was that night and, you know, I, I already have a relationship with Farm Worker Care Coalition. I was like, we could do this. So I want to note that I did that on my own time after hours, <laughs> besides my regular. Duly email. noted, we will report to whoever you. Yeah, my board will be fine, but, <laughs> but it was just, we pulled it together in one week and I just basically did a call out to friends, reached out to Armenia and I said, let's do something here. Let's bring people together. Let's one, let's, get donations and, and get folks, but most importantly, let's lift up those narratives, let's lift up those stories, and let's really thank and honor farm workers who are working sometimes seven days a week under the hot sun with very little pay and sometimes not enough protection. Uh, we pulled it together literally in like six days. It was a huge success. Um, we haven't even totally counted the money, but I think once we're all done, I mean, I have probably close to $90,000 that we raised plus um, four thousand dollars in in, in uh, food cards, etc. So it was a beautiful gathering of community. Uh, it was a caravan, almost like a parade signs. But part of the reason that we did it too, we actually encouraged people to send letters to the editor. You know, the Union Tribune had just published a really great article around essential workers, and a farm worker was not featured. So I think that there's still more work for us to do. I think even with this conversation today, like, let's really remember the folks that are on the front lines feeding us and let's figure out ways to honor and recognize them all year long, not just this caravan or not just on this day, but all of the time. Absolutely. That's, you know, how I think one of the themes um, definitely for, for, for me, as I mentioned earlier, is how do we move forward this definition that has been clarified for us of what's really essential. Um, and I want to mention too that um, we have a farm, it's a community farm here at Leashtag Commons called Coastal Roots Farm, and they have two days a week that is open a pay what you can um, farm stand. And 
they have seen a tremendous rise in need. Um, sometimes they have now it, it's a drive-by system, oh, wow. 100 cars long, um, and 75% of the clients, of the buyers, are, um, are affected in some way by COVID. So not only are our farm workers affected, you know, themselves and vulnerable themselves, but also they're nourishing our most vulnerable populations. And it's, it's just, um, it's a tremendous expression of love that they are showing for our community. And this was such an incredible way to show how much our community really appreciates them in, in both, hopefully, symbolic, but also substantive ways. Um, which which was great. I just want to mention, I probably should have before, that as you have questions, we're going to pause for questions in a bit, but please put them in the chat because that's how we're going to, I already see a couple that have come in, that's how we're going to handle questions. So for any of our panelists really on, on any topic. Um, so Norma, will you um, think about the data, just reacting to the data that Sona presented, even some of the trends that you're seeing, what I know you've already highlighted some of the data that you feel is most um, pertinent to the on the ground situation, but what other data, either that Sona presented or other, would you like us to know about? What other needs would you like us to know about? Yeah, I mean, I would just say that I think Sona's data just paints the picture, right? And I, if you look at the maps, right, the, the, the maps of the region and you see where pockets of poverty have existed before this pandemic, um, to now is that's where we see the greatest need and the greatest hits. And, you know, I, you know, we've heard a lot about flatten the curve. I encourage us all to, to flatten the curve of inequality. Um, because I, I think what this pandemic has done is really revealed or brought to the surface in much more, um, a clear ways that the folks that are going to be that, that, you know, hurting the most, whether it's, you know, con you know the, the, the data of who's getting COVID, right? It's those low-income communities who are still having to go to work. You know, they don't have kind of the privilege that I even I have to work from home. And so they're working from home. They're on the front line serving us, whether it's in the fields, whether it's in the restaurants, whether it's, you know, um, in the medical field. And we see that disproportionately they're coming from low-income communities of color, from communities of color. So I really think that this moment is a transformational moment for us to, like you said, Charlene, let's remember what's essential. Let's value folks that are doing essential work. And then let's make sure that our policies, our practice are aligned to take care of those essential workers because we need them. And so there's not much else I can share besides the fact that the data is clear and that I actually think we need to use this moment to be thinking longer term about the recovery phase of this pandemic and how we're going to kind of right the wrongs of inequity in our region. And so um, the work will have to continue, but I, I hope that we learn from this and that we um, are emboldened to really push for real systemic change to make sure that these workers, you know, have access to full, you know, health care, to good pay and good benefits, et cetera, et cetera. Herminia, any data that uh, or trends that Sona um, presented that you want to particularly highlight? Um? No, um, I just mainly want to add to the data. So uh, part of working in a federally qualified health center who's actually doing testing right now in the in the community is that uh, at Vista Community Clinic, you're doing correct. testing. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So a lot of what, what, what we're seeing is the actual tangible result of what Sona presented. And so, uh, like was shared earlier, the mission at Vista Community Clinic is to provide access to everyone really, but, but we are serving uh, many populations that are underserved. And uh, at the we currently have a uh, at our testing um, outcomes, we have about a close to a 10% positivity rate and most of the folks that we're seeing are Latino, are low income. Some of them are farm workers. I have been identified as farm workers. And so, you know, I think uh, the data really is uh, showing us the great need to, to really think systemically. And I think I definitely echo a lot of what Norma just shared. Uh, but one of the things that, you know, comes to mind right now is that 
we do all of us acknowledge have to think about the long term solutions but the communities and a lot of the work that we're doing in both in the clinic and for farm worker care coalition are, is for immediate response that hopefully will mitigate the long term effects that both um, you know that community members will suffer you know have impacted both financially and personally health wise and so we want to make sure that if as community partners and and um, connecting folks to resources can mitigate that and can set folks up to to really you know um, survive this as best as as and you know we all can um, that we will, we want to make sure to do that a couple of the questions coming in relate um, to um, a return or even a partial return to the workplace or maybe existing workplaces um, that are already deemed essential. Um, personal protective equipment, I, if, like if you see that as a priority. And then also there was a question about um, the workers from Tijuana who crossed the border into the U.S. and concerns may be expressed by staff that might live on this side of the border and how those protections or how those compliance, you know, how it's clearly one affects the other. Um, maybe Norma, do you have any insights into that? Yeah, I'll take that that kind of binational question. So just, okay. I believe it was yesterday or the day before, um, now both governments, the County of San Diego and the government in Mexico, both state and federal government are creating a binational kind of COVID task force, I don't know the exact name, but those are the exact kind of questions and issues that they're gonna be wrestling with uh, because it's gotta be done kind of at the governmental level um, on both sides uh, of the border, having those conversations because our economies are completely intertwined. Um, I mean, even the San Diego Chamber um, does a lot of binational um, kind of economic work. So. I, I really do think that those are really important issues and that both governments are gonna to have to collaborate. I know, I just, I mean, I saw it on, on Twitter, but you know, we heard about our libraries making PPE for the, for the local healthcare workers and that they, they're gonna make about a thousand units, probably they need more, but to Tijuana, I really think the more that we see this region as again, this intrinsically re, um, linked region and that we're thinking holistically about how to protect each other because the virus doesn't see a, you know, a border. Um, and so I, I do think that those are important issues and I hope that these public health cross uh, border agent uh, task forces are gonna be wrestling with that. I also saw the announcement of this specific COVID uh, joint working group. Were there already, which was I think announced by political leadership mm -hmm. were there already I mean there's got to be I know the chambers but like cross border working mm -hmm. groups already and were they already doing any kind of planning that you know of around this pandemic I don't think that anybody was doing any as much proactive planning but I know that right away like when the pandemic started to hit I mean we've seen it um, where um, you know there's been a lot of different kind of bodies of folks figuring out how to help, especially, you know, just like we had our own, you know, government response that is differing by state and, you know, the federal administration, the same dynamic was happening in Mexico where the, the federal government was responding in a certain way versus the folks that are on the ground. And so, yeah, I think that, I don't think there was like proactive preparation, but as soon as, you know, we went into kind of pandemic mode, there's been tons of different bodies of people trying to be proactive and leverage resources and, and you know, raise funds here to go support um, some of the needs there, like in the, in the general hospital in Tijuana where people were on, this, on the floor. So there's been a lot of that, those existing networks have been leveraged to do additional collaboration. So, Sona, are you aware in the food space of any kind of cross-border, either working groups that were already existing or do you see opportunity for that maybe to come out of this as we look at opportunity? Absolutely. I think opportunity, I mean, I, I haven't seen, you know, we haven't seen as much. I think another um, resource that might be, that might, uh, we might be able to bring into this fold would be the Center on Policy Initiatives, where they have a lot of, um, they have a lot of various labor groups that might know a little bit more there, but I think you're spot on, Charlene, and that this is an opportunity for us to, um, for us moving forward. Oh, 
Oh, you're mute. I'm on mute. I know that's the like, that's the new motto of the pandemic, right? You're on mute. You're on mute. Um, are you aware, Herminia, um, just wrapping up this kind of cross border of specific groups or efforts that are specifically for cross border farm workers? I know Farm Worker Cares Coalition is specific around North County, but I, it's a larger regional issue too. Yeah, so I think uh, a little bit about what the cross-border picture looks like for, for workers in, in North County is there's actually a lot of folks that are H-2A worker uh, that hold that type of visa and are working at the sites up here in North County. Can you just define that visa just for those Yeah, who so it's, it's ba basically a visiting worker visa that uh, is based solely on employment and it's at the request of the employer. And so we actually in North County have one of the largest uh, growers that requests H-2A visa workers. And we know that their ranch specifically has closed and has, uh, you know, left folks uh, potentially, uh, you know, stuck here for a little bit until they are able, either financially able to go back and things like that. So that's one impact that we've seen here um, related to you know, the border issue. And I think uh, the other thing, we see less of the driving, to be honest, here in North County, because it is pretty expensive to drive to the border and back up here. So what we do see is folks that come, you know, Monday through Friday, uh, and then go back on Friday and Saturday and then stay throughout the weekend. And, and so we feel like we're seeing less of that. Uh, we also are related to, to um, to not the border, but really enforcement is that in North County, where a lot of the farms are located, which is the Fallbrook area, we're seeing higher levels of uh, actually immigration enforcement that really, you know, adds a different layer of how folks are affected by the pandemic. So we know the, the pandemic is already causing traumatic stress, but then, you know, couple that with what is seeing increased enforcement in your community, I think it, it really causes folks to, to experience this at a different, uh, you know, at a different level of stress. And, and so we're really concerned about that. And then in general, um, I, I look to uh, one of the questions in the chat, if that's okay, I want to touch on that really briefly, uh, because it does relate to what we're doing in terms of making sure that farm workers are connected. So we want to ensure all uh, folks, including our team and our farm workers have access to PPE. Uh, but one of the things that we're seeing is that PPE is, is one portion of protecting yourself and social distancing is another and, you know, having hand washing stations at work sites and all of those things really need to go hand in hand. I think we all know that, you know, there's different ways to protect yourself, but that really all have, you know, protective practices have to be really, you know, kind of honed in and accessible. I think accessible being the key word here is that we know that folks are going to their work sites, and especially, you know, the fields and hand washing stations might not be accessible as, as we think they are. And so one of the things that, that we're currently working on is making sure that we, through the donations that we're getting, we're delivering PPE equipment to farm workers and making sure that they have access to that, to the equal, you know, uh, you know, uh, when I say equal access, I mean just making sure that we're going to them with the protective equipment and that, you know, we're not leaving it to chance that they might be able to get access to that on their own. Do you, I know the employers are, of course, you know, seeing guidance from the state and from others from the Board of Agriculture. Do you work at all with employers in order to make sure that they're complying in a yeah, so we actually, a part of the partnership that both Vista Community Clinic and Farm Worker Care Coalition has, uh, we've actually been working with our grower partners in North County to, to get access to their site, to their work site. So in the past, we used to have what we called mini health fairs, which we would take, go out into the field and take out, uh, you know, health services, preventative health services out into their work sites because we know that the feasibility of someone taking a day off work to come see the doctor is, you know, pretty, it's a tough uh, situation to be in. And so we wanted to make sure that we were increasing access and going to the work sites. So one, we are no longer able to do that, but we are still reaching out to our partners and making sure that we're providing education. And some, 
uh, through those conversations with each of those employers have shed light in terms of what the, the protective uh, measures they've set into place. Some look di different and some of it comes down to space and access to resources really. And so uh, one of the things that we've seen is those that can't comply have actually uh, uh, opted to shut down. Uh, the nurseries being one of the uh, most uh, affected by the closures. And so lots of folks who relied on nursery work are having to do other types of work to, to supplement that. And uh, one of the things that, that you know, Sona and I have talked about in the past is just that the agricultural uh, makeup and landscape for workers is, is so intersectional here in, in San Diego because folks can work in the fields one day, work in as a day laborer another day, and then also work in nurseries and as a, a way to supplement that assistance or, you know, to supplement their, their income and, and really make sure that they have a, access to a living wage by, you know, working multiple jobs. And so, uh, you know, just sharing a little tidbit there, but uh, we know folks, I think, are trying to do their best, but there definitely is a gap in getting resources. I mean, even the clinic, we, we're being strategic in terms of making sure that all of our employees are protected, but, uh, but you know, where all of us are competing for, for, you know, those resources, tangible masks and procedure masks, which I think are what we're needing more as an agency. And so just to shed light a little bit on what that looks like from an employer perspective. Thank you. Before we've outlined a lot of need and please keep any questions coming. Um, and we, we do wanna move to the kind of the recommendations or what we can do about it piece. Um, there's so much and it's evolving. Um, before we do that though, um, Norma, can we, it's just, it's, we've heard a lot of data and important on the ground context, but the stories of individuals, this, the data is just compiled the stories of thousands of individuals and it's so easy for them to get lost. Can you share a story um, that you think would be particularly um, evocative of some of the challenges and, and opportunities that might be out there? I'll share the story of uh, my sister, Sylvia, has been a teacher for 25 years in, in South Bay School District and San Ysidro School. She's a first grade teacher. She's my older sister. You could tell we're a family of strong women, I'll say. Um, but uh, so my sister, Sylvia, who, you know, had, is a public school teacher and had to, you know, she's right on the border. She's in that community. And if you look at the map, San Ysidro, that 92173 zip code is one of the highest for all sorts of reasons. It's a very poor community, lots of essential workers. It's right on the border. So bottom line, my sister Sylvia had to adjust to, you know, her 27 kids, get them into distance learning. She calls me one night and says, I finally got a hold of this parent who for the two weeks, I just couldn't get a hold of, you know, this one child and parent. And she's like, Norma, the mom is COVID positive. She's, she just got released from the hospital and she's been sick. Single mom with three kids, including a first grader. And she, this, this woman, um, she, worked, uh, she worked at a factory. So she wasn't necessarily working in the field or a restaurant, but it was a factory um, in Otay Mesa that was dealing with some kind of, of I don't know exactly what goods. Uh, but bottom line, the issue was that this, this mother, when tested positive and when she got sick, she had no child care. She's a single mom. What is she going to do with three kids, you know? And so she ended up sending her children to her mother's house, so the children's grandmother in Tijuana, so that they could be, I mean, she can't leave these kids alone, right? And so she sent the kids there to Tijuana, and then she was at home. So when, when my sister was able to connect with her via phone, um, my sister calls me, you know, she's not a social worker. My sister's a teacher, but she's like, Norma, she got released from the hospital and she thinks that they might've canceled her Medi-Cal and she didn't get her medication. And she's too afraid to go out to the pharmacy to pick up her medication because she's COVID positive and she doesn't want to spread it. So she was being ultraly cautious. Um, you know, I'll just share that to say that one good thing that you know, she was connected to my sister who, as a teacher, wanted to do all she could um, to connect her. And, and, you know, and then her, she knows me. So we connected her to San Isidro Health Center, 
where she was already a, a patient and San Isidro was able to deliver her medication to her door. You know, once they connected on the phone or whatever happened. And then we also connected her to a, a community-based organization in San Isidro, Casa Familiar, who was, she was also running kind of a little bit out of groceries um, because she, you know, was just too afraid to go out. And so Casa Familiar was able to bring her groceries, again, practicing social distancing and living at, at the door. And so my sister still checks in with her. She was able to get her son, even from Tijuana, to get internet and, and be able to join my sister's classes. But I'll just say that there's so many folks that are falling through the cracks and that are in need of support. And ultimately, it's going to come to all of us, whether we're a teacher, whether we're a social worker, whether we're an employer, right? Like Marie or others, like it's going to be all of us. It's going to take all of us to look out for each other and then, um, you know, figure out how to just to connect people. Because sometimes people that are in the most need don't know how to navigate systems, don't know how to, you know, they're not keeping up with where the latest food distribution site is. And, you know, so we definitely need to connect people and it's going to take all of us. So I'll share that story as a story of an example of the impact. Just ex thank you. Expanding on that a bit, what you just said before we ask Herminia to share a story and then Sona to share the more um, official policy recommendations. I guess I've been thinking a lot like about like talking points, you know, like we're getting in a lot of data. We're privileged enough to be part of these webinars. How are we getting, how are we giving voice to farm workers or food or the single mother that really don't get much voice in our society? Like, what should I say on the next Zoom happy hour? Like the one or two salient points to really, I guess, both champion for this issue and spread knowledge about these issues, but also what can I really do? Um, there are some things have come up today, but if there's any um, directives that you want to give our group, that would be really, really helpful, Norma. Yeah, 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 yeah. So one, I think all of us from wherever we sit, we have an opportunity to, to you know, we're reading the newspaper, right? So when you see that there are stories missing, figure out how to write a letter to the editor and say, hey, what about this? You know, you know, why aren't you talking about this? Like, I feel like, you know, many of us have subscriptions to the Union Tribune and the Union Tribune is a good paper, you know, but we should be ourselves, like take it upon ourselves to just try to encourage journalism to cover some of these stories and then we connect them. We, you know, Erminia has probably dozens of farm workers, you know, narratives that could be lifted up. So I think we can also, as, as uh, uh, subscribers of, of our local paper, you know, engage in those conversations online and, you know, use our own platforms, whatever they might be, to, to lift up those stories and, and to raise questions. That's one thing. The, the other thing I will know is ACLU, along with many other folks, have been working for years. We have a coalition called Invest in Family San Diego. Uh, you can just Google it. Um, and this includes Center on Policy Initiatives, Mid City Can. I mean, I think it's like over 15 orgs. And we really have been working for years on pushing for our county government to be much more transparent and much more accountable to the needs of low income communities of color. And so it's called Invest in Family San Diego. There's a policy platform there where people can take action. There's a lot of public meetings that are happening. And for those of us that are able to be at home and participate in you know, a county board of supervisors meeting or my local city council meeting, for those of us that are you know, like that kind of stuff, um, I would just say that you know, participate in those meetings and during public comment, lift up some of the policy recommendations that you know, so now we'll share as well as you could see it in the Invest in Families San Diego website, kind of what are asked. I'll give you an example. You know, week one of this pandemic, you know, the county uh, was not translating a lot of the public health information. And I myself saw firsthand that my mom was not getting the same level of information about the pandemic as I was, because I'm an English speaker. And so you know, like, let's continue to, you know, so we were asking, we, you know, we submitted a letter, you know, of course, you know, they, they started translating. And then I think it was about two or three weeks ago, their, their daily public health official updates. Now they partnered with Univision television, and they're doing simultaneous translation. That's good. That's important. 
And that's just one language. There's other language needs. So I would say that we have an opportunity to use the media as a way to do letters to the editor and lift up those stories, use whatever platforms we have. And then for those of us that like to participate in public meetings, governing bodies, and like to listen into those hearings, some of those political nerds, it's a great opportunity to give public comment. And I will say, you know, uh, for folks that don't live in those disproportionately impacted communities. That's how we're gonna be able to affect change. When not only do, will we organize and lift up the voices of folks most impacted, but when we have allies from Encinitas and La Jolla and Del Mar and other places that are more affluent that can say, yes, we have to address these issues of equity. Yes, we have to, we have to do X, Y, and Z. That's when we will be more powerful and lawmakers are going to listen to us more when they see that folks across class and across different geographies are saying the same thing. So I would say stay connected to us and we'll continue to figure out, Charlene, how to even let you know kind of some of our policy asks. And for those folks that it aligns with your values, make, send an email, make a call. Thank you. And I think just thinking back to the quote that you said at the beginning about the interconnectedness of all, I mean, our health literally depends on, on those people in the underrepresented communities really understanding, say, the COVID guidance or what. So for whatever reason that you do it, it's in our, both our self-interest and in the community interest to really lift up and amplify those needs and voices um, at every level. Herminia, I'd love to hear a story from you of a, a farm worker, maybe that Vista Community Clinic serves or that you know of that you think just best exemplifies what we've talked about today. Yeah, I, I uh, want to share a story about uh, our, not a story because this is an everyday kind of happening. Uh, we uh, at Vista Community Clinic and through Farm Worker Care work with promotoras or community health workers that are volunteer folks in the community who are our go-tos. Uh, and in Fallbrook, in one of the hardest to reach areas that we work with, there's a lot of farms and a lot of agricultural sites that are kind of huddled together. And there's kind of groupings of folks that live in the area. So in Fallbrook, we have Maricela, uh, who's one of our promotoras or our leaders. And um, she's uh, our, I think, eyes and ears every day. And so she'll call us whenever someone needs something. And then folks will look for her when people need something. And she's a farm worker her, herself, a single mom who is tending not only to her children, but also her grandkids. And then I would say an entire community. So she's one of the few folks that has, has access to cell phones. And so folks, you know, even when folks need a, to, for the clinic to come pick them up, which we uh, have, you know, provide transportation, they'll call her to help set this up. So I think of her uh, a lot during these times because she is who, makes our work possible and you know folks trust her and come to her with the different needs i think that remembering humility and and humility in the service that we provide is so important because i think it takes a lot of courage for folks to reach out you know i'm, I'm sure in norma's example that you know the uh the mom wasn't reaching out for food because she was afraid to you know one expose people but also uh, you know, it takes a lot of courage to ask for help, especially when you've worked hard set. So, you know, as a lot of these families have to set yourself up and, and, you know, support yourself, you know, by your own means, which is a lot of what we see in, in folks coming here to work, you know, they want sustainability for their families, they want to thrive for their families. And so when they're set up in these situations where they have to ask for help, it, it takes a different level of courage. Uh, so Maricela is, uh, she goes out with us once a week to distribute food. Of course, we provide PPE and all of our team practices social distancing. And um, I should have uploaded it so that I could share, but I have tons of pictures of her doing um, all of this amazing work because we want to make sure that we're capturing it and that we are doing due diligence to, to tell her story, tell of her efforts, and and really give her the recognition she deserves. Uh, we offered though to write a an op-ed, and although you know I share her name in um, 
and you know um, she was come no, she wasn't feeling comfortable with sharing much more than that um, and so uh, you know I wanted to just share that thank you and and if you can upload a couple of those pictures we'll include that in the post meeting follow-up as well as the website Norma for um, invest in families um, and which will also be on our website for people that didn't that weren't able to make it um, today so we'll be able to remember Maricela as we're thinking about this work so th thank you Herminia um, I think with that Sona we've really outlined a lot of need and some really good recommendations and opportunities as well can you share the uh, some additional opportunity to the Food System Alliances for funders and policymakers? Yeah, yes, uh, thank you so much, Charlene. And thank you, Norma and Herminia. Thank you so much for working so tirelessly every day for human rights, farm worker rights, all the rights for people that um, don't have them. So thank you so much. And I think you guys actually, both, the, both of you really did lift up a lot of the priorities that we um, have highlighted as well. And I'll just sort of shift my screen again so that uh, you all can see, um, see what I'm referencing. Uh, and yeah, so starting right there with food and farm workers, let's, um, you know, you know, look at that, look at that right off the bat. I mean, we've sort of outlined, and I think Herminia and Norma both touched on many of the things in here, but we've outlined three main, three main areas. Um, financial relief is always number one. You know, we need more relief funds, flexible relief funds to be able to support loss of income and basic, basic living expenses. So this was highlighted several times. Um, by both Norma and, her, and Herminia. So financial relief. And then the second one, there's a lot loaded in here. Protect health, safety, and rights to organize. You know, these are some of the challenges that we've seen pre-pandemic, and it's even more important now. And again, I think they both highlighted a lot of this, but really ensuring that food and farm workers have proper health safety measures. They have access to health care, child care, family care, being able to actually have labor rights to, to, to organize, regardless of their immigration, sta immigration status. So that's, um, that's number two. And then the third one also really, um, really loaded here, but establishing moratoriums. You know, we've heard, heard Norma, you know, highlight that there's, you know, a little bit more flexibility that's happening at the border, you know, but really it's not enough. It's insufficient. You know, we really need to be able to establish moratoriums and lift some of, some of the, restri any restrictions, repatriations, deportations, evictions that we're, that we're seeing. Um, similarly, with food businesses, you know, we're seeing the same thing, financial relief. And again, these are the businesses that are employing our food and farm workers. So if they're not in business, then they're not going to be able to retain, retain employees. And so needing financial relief funds to really be able to support, support them and then assisting them in being able to provide these employee benefits. Again, how do, they, how do these businesses make sure that their employees are safe? that the conditions are safe, that they have the protective equipment that they need, that they have um, paid sick leave, paid and sick leave, that they have healthcare coverage to be able to take care of themselves or anyone in their family that's impacted. And then of course, again, moratorium, same, same um, idea. And then with farms and fisheries, um, you know, it's, it's a lot of these same trends, but the financial relief is just, huge here because this is where if our farmers are not able to survive um, survive then our farm workers our essential farm workers are really um, not going to be able to be employed and if our farm workers and farm farmers are not able to survive then that is the backbone of our food system so the question will be how will we feed how will we feed ourselves and how will we feed our communities? And then this idea of technical support, I think it, it, it ties a little bit to what I heard Norma and Herminia both say, but you know, there's, there's, there's a need for that. Um, we have to remain connected. We have to be able to make sure that those that need resources are able to get them. And so whether it's the food, it's food producers or the food producers ability to be able to get that information to farm workers or food workers, we need to increase technical support around what types of policies and protective measures need to happen in the fields, in the fields, on the trucks, in the restaurant, wherever, wherever frontline workers are, where, wherever they may be. 
Um, and then there's, you know, the, the, this is, uh, you know, investing in local food infrastructure is also really important because we're realizing during this time that, you know, we can't rely, global and national food supply chains are really failing us. And so there's really an importance to make sure that we're taking care of those that are working in our communities to feed our communities. And so there's really that local, local investment that's really key. And then, you know, when we go to food and food security, you know, the, the funding, the relief is, is again, supporting hunger relief organizations, our food banks, they're working double time. They're really, there are funds that are being directed towards them, but it's grossly insufficient. And schools also just trying to get more support to schools and, and helping some of these uh, folks be able to procure local produce so that they can support our local farmers and, and farm workers. And then finally, our biggest defense has always been SNAP, which Charlene uh, references the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, and that's really how um, many of our communities are able to access food pre-pandemic, during the pandemic, and post and post-pandemic. And these pro benefit programs um, really need improvements. They need to be more accessible so that everybody is able to access them. They need to have all the maximum allowable amounts so that people are really be, be able to get the amount of food that they need in order to keep themselves and their families, families nourished. So, you know, I mean, uh, uh, Norma really said it really well earlier in highlighting that this is important now. You know, what we're highlighting are immediate responses, immediate actions we can all take, but we all know that these actions need to continue and they need to actually generate greater momentum as we move forward on a day-to-day day -day basis. So we really need to capitalize on this, well, capitalize might not be the right word, but leverage this transformational moment as, as Norma described it, and really recognize that how are we, or how do we, while we're taking care of these immediate needs, how do we also carve out the time and space for us to imagine a better food system. Imagine a food system that actually meets the vision that we all have, which is that takes care of our frontline workers, that takes care of that essential workforce. And, and so we invite you, we just want to share that we are in the process, fortunately, of launching a Food Vision 2030 process. Herminia's and, Herminia and Farm Worker Care Coalition are, are um, actively involved in this process, but we are developing a, a vision for the next decade, and we hope that this will be um, influenced by what's happening today in, with the pandemic and that we're able to lift up policies and priorities that we're, that we're going to have to invest in over the next decade, not just over the next year. So thank you again, Charlene. Thank you, Sona. These are really just such important um, recommendations and we will again send out the report that I just you know, the Food System Alliance has just been so quick in producing this important information and somebody, I think Norma, or maybe you did, Sona, referenced the Center on Policy Initiatives. I mean, just the real-time data that is feeding this crisis is really gonna, no pun intended, that is undergirding this crisis is just the most important thing we can be monitoring right now and, and responding to. Another thing that just I want to amplify in terms of moving that I'm thinking more about is just the cross-border working groups, just like for the longer term, thinking about how interlinked we are. The importance of those, I think, just is so amplified now and is so important to our longer term health and security and, every, you know, in all ways. So I'm going to think, I'm going to learn more about what those efforts are myself. Um, so I want to, before I turn it over to Jenny to do any kind of final wrap up, I want to just really, really, really thank our terrific panelists. Um, if it's okay, we'll include your, your contact info or your email addresses in the follow up. So if people have follow up questions, they can get in touch with you. But Sona, Norma, Herminia, you're on the ground. You're really um, amplifying the voices of the silent and we are so so we kind of stand on your shoulders, I feel like. So thank you. Um, you're really doing a lot of heavy lifting. Thank you very much for taking the time. And Jenny, any final words? Just again, Charlene, I want to echo your sentiments. I really appreciate all of you taking the time when there is so much on your plates to um, engage with us and provide us kind of on the ground information that not all of us have the privilege to witness firsthand. So thank you. Our next session is Wednesday, May 27th with founder and CEO of Moisha House, David Siegelman, who's gonna speak about uh, leading a global organization 
um, through the pandemic. So I will send all of that information in the follow-up along with the contact information for the panelists for this session and hope to see you um, all back here in a few weeks. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank Have a good you. day, everybody. Bye, everyone.